as uh, Ambassador Aho reminded us, it started before the reign of Louis XVI, who is, of course, the, a key figure in the story. It started in the time of Louis XV, at the end of the Seven Year War, which was a great humiliation for France and which led to the loss of a huge uh, territories, especially the loss of Canada. And um, in the 1770s, so during the reign of Louis XV, um, the government of Choiseul, of the Duc de Choiseul, um, tried to took advantage, as Ambassador Aho reminded, of the crisis of the Falkland Islands, of the Ile Malouine, to break a, a war with um, Great Britain. But uh, Louis XV was against that. Was it because of his character? He would decide to go for a war against Great Britain? Or it was mainly because of the, fin the international internal reforms that he was pushing ahead, especially the, the reform of the judiciary. And it was not only the reform of the judiciary, judiciary sorry, but also the, the fight with the parliament, which would eventually become a political uh, power. And um, what was officially the position of France not to take part, not to help Spain in the Malouin issue, was not totally the truth, because at that time there was the, what we call the secret du roi, the secret, secret diplomacy that was uh, running its own route, uh, parallel to the uh, public diplomacy of the kingdom. And we know that uh, in 1768, Choiseul sent a Baron de Calp in to America, to know the feelings of the American uh, people, uh, the, the situation the, and of unrest in the British colonies. And he, Kalb, in his uh, report, estimated, les bouts de feu auraient le dessous. And um, so that the Americans would be beaten by the, the British. And but he had the feeling that London would be ready to make concessions. So even in uh, 1768, and he noted, le grand esprit d'indépendance et de licence dans tous les individus de ce pays. So the great spirit for freedom, for independence of anyone he met in America. And he knew that he had the feeling that that would lead to uh, an independent state, an état indépendant. So in 1768, and, and like what was the official uh, position of France, there was this feeling started that there was something really important happening in America that could change the face of the world. And uh, then uh, it's with um, the... Uh, new king, uh, Louis XVI, that the political uh, personnel changed and that eventually Vergen came into power. Vergen as not the, the prime minister, though the function doesn't really exist in France, but at that time it was Morepa, an old man, an old consular to Louis XVI. But Vergen was the ministre des affaires étrangères. And... Um, Eventually, he took great importance within the ministry, within the court in Versailles in those uh, crucial years. Um, he was against the secret du roi, though he had been part of it, but he knew that a more open diplomacy should have, been, uh, should have to be played, uh, especially against Great Britain, if uh, things had to, be, um, to evolve. And um, that was not the, the position of everyone in, in France at that time, and especially, if you can, as you can imagine, a new, uh, the, this new vision of helping uh, the American insurgents was not shared by um, the Minister of Finance, the Controller General des Finances, Turgot, who eventually had to resign in May 1776. 
And it's in this uh, crucial year that really the French government, the French court, started um, to build a policy towards the, the insurgents. But at the beginning, as Ambassador Aho also quote, um, reminded us, the French were very um, um, afraid or didn't know what to think about the American insurgents, about their uh, strength, about their real um, position uh, towards France. And that can be understood because, as you know, these very people that France was going to help in the, f in the coming years were the very ones that had been fighting the French uh, in, in the middle of the century during the Seven Year War and that, that led to the uh, loss of Canada. And just to remind you this fact, uh, remember the the engraving that Benjamin Franklin published in 1754 of the American rattlesnake showing the, seven, the 13 um, provinces divided and to show that if they were not united, they would lose. But in his mind of a good uh, British uh, um, um, subject of the time, his mind was not against London, but it was against Versailles and against the French uh, people, um, the French troops in Canada. So really there is a not, uh, it's not an obvious story to link, to have this link between France and the American insurgents. And the position of Louis XVI in that uh, issue is very important. And... Um, First of all, he couldn't be happy to help um, a new regime uh, that was going to be a republican regime against a monarchy, one of the oldest monarchies in, in, in Europe, even though an enemy to France for several times. But still, that was going against the established order all of Europe, and that was against his own throne. But nevertheless, there were other reasons to, to, help, to help the American insurgents. And so the revenge uh, from um, the Seven Year War and the Treaty of Paris of 1763, but very wisely, the cabinet in France in those years didn't consider the revenge as a real military revenge or revenge to gain back what had been lost through the Treaty of Paris, especially Canada, but uh, a revenge in a more global vision of a changing Europe. And uh, very wisely, the idea was not to defeat Great Britain um, and to fight against her, and especially not to fight on its uh, territory. That is to say, on the British islands, and you know there were quite a few um, tentatives to to um, step foot on the British um, islands uh, in the past century, and uh, but this time the French were much wiser, and they considered uh, fighting against Britain through the American, um, the American insurgents so that they could regain a balance of power in Europe. Not to crash down Great Britain, but to gain power. And especially because the uh, balance of power was changing in Europe, especially with the rise of new countries, new uh, strong uh, countries in Eastern Europe, that is to say, uh, Prussia, uh, Russia, and Austria. From 1756, uh, Austria was uh, the new ally of France, and was not questioned to um, not help or not stay with this new ally, especially since the new queen was from the House of Habsburg. But that was not also to follow the what was happening in uh, Eastern Europe, and especially with the threats on Poland and France, was trying to protect Poland as much as possible. And 
more widely also the threats that Russia uh, was uh, putting on the uh, Turkish um, empire uh, in the Black Sea and through the Mediterranean uh, uh, Sea. So that's how the, the French government and Vergen conceived the way they could step into this, um, into this war. First of all, it was done uh, secretly, and therefore, as you know, um, Beaumarchais was involved. Caron de Beaumarchais was involved in the first uh, supply of helps to the American insurgents. Beaumarchais was from a family of um, clockmakers, clockmakers to the king. His father was one of the clockmakers to the king. And eventually he gave up that business, though he knew a lot about it. He was a mechanic uh, in his own right. And especially in the musician, uh, musical world, he composed music and also improved the harp uh, mechanisms. And through his contact with the banker, Joseph Paris Duvernay, in Paris, he started, uh, he joined the world of finance and uh, speculation. And that was his mainstream. But even though in 1759, he became the professor of harp for the daughters of Louis XV. And from that time onwards, he was included into the secret of the king, the secret du roi. So it's a strange position that this uh, writer, musician, uh, uh, Beaumarchais. And uh, Beaumarchais was uh, allowed, but on the king's pressure, on the government's pressure, to uh, create on the 2nd of May 1776 um, a company called Rod Rod Rodrigue Hortales and company with a Spanish name. And it's funny because that was the, the purpose was to join Spain in the financial effort to support the American insurgents. And in this company that was uh, settled in an old townhouse in the Marais, um, France put one million pounds, French pounds, and uh, Spain put the same amount. So it was through uh, Beaumarchais and the company, Rodrigue Hortales and company, that the, the first uh, means were sent to um, America. And also ships were, um, were sent to, to help the Americans, 12 ships in Brest and eight ships in, in Toulon. And um, the... The diplomacy started quite secretly with the, with the Americans. And uh, the position of Louis XVI is uh, clearly um, said, expressed in one of his letters. He said on the 18th of October, 1770. Six, but first I would like to show you that the, the government was not involved. There was still peace with Great Britain in those years, 1776, um, in the year 1776, which is, which is crucial. And, but uh, with what was happening with Beaumarchais and others secretly, um, um, a member of um, the, the administration, Edme Jacques Genet, published um, after the Declaration of Independence uh, of July 1776, he published on the 16th of August 1776 the Declaration in extenso a um, newspaper called Affaires de l'Angleterre et de l'Amérique. And he says, on, he publishes, On m'apporte, monsieur, une traduction de l'acte du Congrès général de l'Amérique du 4 juillet. C'est sans contredit le plus grand événement de la campagne, de la guerre même, et peut-être de ce siècle. Je vais le transcrire ici, en sa totalité, car il ne faut en rien perdre. De pareils écrits et des subversions d'empire sont choses très rares, heureusement. So, such uh, um, declarations are um, amazing, um, because they are very subversive, but fortunately they are extremely rare. This is the official voice, in a way, of the government. So the government can't, cannot say that 
the Declaration of Independence is, the, is a brilliant document and brings something totally new to the world. And that's why the last uh, sentence is that subversion is very rarely happening. But it gives an idea to the French society that the French government, that Versailles, was supporting uh, this declaration. And so Louis XVI, on the 18th of October 1776, wrote... Si nous sommes forcés de faire la guerre à l'Angleterre, il faut que cela soit pour la défense de nos possessions et l'abaissement de la puissance, non dans aucune idée d'agrandissement territorial pour nous, mais seulement en tâchant de ruiner leur commerce et de miner leur force en soutenant la révolte et la séparation des colonies. So really, the vision of Louis XVI and of the government is to counterbalance the power of uh, Great Britain, and not to gain territory, but to ruin its uh, growing uh, commercial empire and try to get back to this uh, trade in uh, all over the world, actually. So through these documents, we know quite clearly what was the position of, uh, of France. And that's why um, the Americans, uh, the secret committee, uh, sent in the American Secret Committee, uh, which has started with the French monarchy since 1775 negotiations, secret negotiations, obviously, sent in March 1776 uh, Silas Dean from the Congress uh, to buy military equipment in, in Europe and especially in France. Um, the, after the Declaration of Independence and the evolution of the position, it was more and more obvious that uh, France would support uh, the American insurgents. And um, a group of representatives were sent uh, from the Congress, uh, led by Benjamin Franklin, who arrived in, he was sent in October 1776, arrived in Paris in uh, December 1776. And... Uh, it's interesting to know how he was housed when he arrived, and eventually he stayed uh, several years, as you know, in France. He was first housed in a hotel, in ho different hotels in Paris, the Hotel d'Entragues, Rue de l'Université, and then the Hotel d'Ambourg, Rue Jacob, so uh, hotels for travelers. And eventually, in March 1777, he was housed uh, freely by... Um, an entrepreneur in, with the East Indies uh, called Jacques Donatien Le Red Chaumont in a wonderful uh, hotel particulier on the outskirts of pa Paris in Passy, west of Paris. Now, nowadays it's included in Paris, but at that time it was not. And um, in this house that Le Red Chaumont had bought in 1776, and this is a beautiful house with the seven hectares gardens close to the royal chateau of La Muette. And uh, first, uh, Franklin was, Benjamin Franklin was housed in a small house in the domain and eventually, in 1779, moved to the main building, so really shared with the Le Red Chaumont family uh, that uh, beautiful town house. And eventually, the Hotel de Valentinois, it was its former owner, the Hotel de Valentinois became the first American legation until 1787. Um, but the, the, and other uh, envoys came to, to, to Paris and joined Benjamin Franklin, uh, so Silas Dean was already there, uh, John Adams uh, slightly later, and uh, Arthur Lee as well. And they were not uh, working with the French government openly still, and uh, they had to meet in secret places, mostly in Paris or sometimes in Versailles, but not in the, in the palace itself. We know that. And when the involvement of France became obvious, then they had official meetings with Vergen in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in, the, in Versailles itself. And uh, 
as we were told, the French was, were a bit worried of these allies, were their military strong enough against Great Britain and after the victory of Saratoga, but of Saratoga, then France was reassured that they could go further uh, to a war against Great Britain. And eventually, after seeing treaties with the American envoys in early 1778, finally, Louis XVI uh, received um, um, Benjamin Franklin and the other envoys in Versailles, officially at an official audience on the 20th of March, 1778. And on 22nd, it's the Queen and the other members of the royal family who gave audiences to the delegation. And the Duke of Croy, Duke de Croy, uh, recalls this uh, audience, and I'll try maybe not to read too much in French, but it's important because it gives really um, uh, insight vision of something that had never happened before in Versailles. Audiences are very um, elaborate moments in the court life, and these Americans were going to break the rules. And um, so, the Duke de Croix wrote, au lever, euh, je trouvais à l'œil de bœuf le fameux Franklin avec les deux autres députés de l'Amérique, entouré de bien du monde, frappé de cet important spectacle. So the uh, envoys had to gather after discovering this amazing palace, I have to say, going through the Hall of Mirrors, uh, entering the antichambre de l'œil de bœuf, they were waiting to be allowed to enter the king's bedroom, the king's bedchamber, where the audience uh, was going to take place. So you have to imagine the contrast between what the, these Americans have been seen both in America and at the court in London, where Benjamin Franklin had been and a few others too, with the, the, the luxury of uh, Versailles, of the court and of the surroundings. And um, the Duc de Croix goes on. La figure pittoresque du beau vieillard, avec ses bésicles et sa tête chauve, son air de patriarche et fondateur de la nation, joint à sa célébrité comme inventeur de l'électricité, législateur des 13 provinces unies, et sa science ajoutait encore à la beauté du tableau. And uh, we know that what Benjamin Franklin, when he came to France, he didn't have to prove anything. He was already extremely famous. He had been to France twice before, and especially in 1767, he was presented to King Louis XV. So he knew Versailles, he knew the court, he knew how different it was from uh, the court of St. James's and the life in America, what were the rules, and he was admired as, uh, as a scientist, as a great scientist, and he was a member of different royal academies in France since the early 1770s. And with all that background, he, he came as a hero. But the hero of a new type of a nation, of a new regime, of, uh, from a new continent that was not yet included so much in the social history of Europe. And that's why he decided to embody the spirit of the new nation, of the new country, um, in, the, in the spirit of the time of the Enlightenment with the works of Rousseau on the bon sauvage and on the new values of uh, simplicity against sophistication, and you know how sophisticated the court was, that was the role that Benjamin Franklin decided to play. And so he broke the rule by not wearing a proper French abbey for the audience with uh, the proper um, sword and the proper hat he was supposed to wear, but just wore his plain brown coat with his uh, very simple uh, hat, which was not the tricone shape that was compulsory at the court, but a, a round one. And that make the, the whole story because people were on one hand horrified by seeing these, uh, these so many rules broken by a person in front of the king, but on the other hand they were excited and some excitement 
one of uh, the, the scandal. And it was a, a great success. B B uh, Franklin was the uh, popular figure in, in, in Versailles, in Paris, and in France at that time. That was not the case, I have to say, for his colleagues who tried, but not with the same capability, with the same intelligence, to play the role of a, coming from of representatives from a new nation, but they were not uh, playing it so wisely. Uh, and let me take two examples. Uh, Arthur Lee, for example, he was maybe the most the one who should have been the most at ease in Versailles. He was a, from a very good family uh, with strong links with Great Britain, with the, the court. He was speaking quite fluently French, so he should have been at ease there. But on the other hand, and maybe because of a Protestant background, he was so stiff um, um, and that he became hated by everyone in Versailles very soon. And you have to understand that within the uh, American delegation, there was not, strangely enough, uh, a sense of uh, unity. There were dissensions between Benjamin Franklin, Arthur Lee, uh, Silas Dean, and especially John Adams, and we'll see some examples of that uh, dissensions and these uh, fights within these envoys. And so obviously, Arthur Lee was appalled by the way Franklin was behaving, but he, Franklin was right and Lee was wrong. And so he, he really failed to convince and to seduce the court. And uh, for the, um, another character, John Adams, who was going to play a very important role in the following years, it's also the same. John Adams was maybe the most the strict Protestant of the group. And uh, first of all, he was uh, very jealous of uh, Benjamin Franklin. He says on Benjamin Franklin, quote, on Dr. Franklin, the eyes of all Europe are fixed as the most important character in American affairs in Europe. Neither Lee nor myself are looked upon of much consequence. The attention of the court seems most to Franklin, and no wonder, his long and great reputation, to which Lee's and mine are in their infancy, are enough to account for this. So there is a lot of resentment from John Adams towards uh, um, Benjamin Franklin. And, uh, and the other problem for Adams, that he was confused with the famous Adam, with Adams, with Samuel Adams. And once people realized that they were not facing, in France, that they were not facing Samuel Adams, but John Adams, then he, he had to admit, and quote, it being settled that he, but it's John Adams who speaks, it being settled that he was not the famous Adams, the, cons the consequence was plain. He was some man that nobody had ever heard of before, and therefore a man of no consequence, a cipher. And so we can understand why uh, John Adams was not at his at the French court with all these uh, um, dramas that broke when he arrived. And, and uh, so in a funny quote, he stresses once he was invited, he took part to uh, what we call the Grand Couvert. It's another public ceremony that takes place two or three evenings a week where the king and the royal family, the king and the queen most of the time, but sometimes other members of the royal family, dine in public. It's in the Queen's apartment in one of the big antechambers there, so it's a very important uh, ceremony. Uh, anyone can come uh, until the room is full, of course, but then you have the King and the Queen sitting at the table on, at one end of the room. Then in front of them, of the royal table, you have a seat of uh, stools for the duchesses, who are the only ones who are allowed to sit for this ceremony, and otherwise the nobility, the courtiers and the visitors are standing in the room, and these dinners take place in music, 
and with a very important uh, ceremonial. So um, John Adams were um, invited to this Grand Couvert and he found any reasons not to like it. Not, he doesn't mention the fact that this is a stupid or an awkward ceremony for him, but he said that um, he was forced to be standing on the first uh, row after the duchesses and saying, quote, the, fam the royal family had a fancy to see the raw American at their leisure. So that was his feeling. And he was not feeling at ease because he said, quote, my dress was a decent French dress, but not to be compared with gold and diamonds and embroidery about me. The eyes of all assembly were turned upon me, and I felt sufficiently humble and mortified, for I was not a proper object for the criticisms of such a company. I found myself gazed at, as we in America used to gaze at the sachems who came to make speeches to us in Congress. So it's the way the story is returned for this uh, American in Versailles, and how the, the links between the two countries were started with this um, excitement for the new insurgents, but especially through the figure of Benjamin Franklin and through the excitement of the nobility that went eventually to fight with the Americans in overseas. Thank you very much.